our view is that really the, the investment and the development needs to come in the upstream, um, in the mining. Um, and that's, that relies on countries such as Australia, um, Chile, the emergent, emerging players in Argentina and other parts of the world. Morning all. Um, as Amy said, I, I'm not Cameron Perks. Um, my name is Harry Fisher, also from Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. Um, unfortunately, Cameron couldn't make it this morning. He, his flight was cancelled from, from Melbourne. He sends his apologies. Um, if you have any very detailed lithium questions, then he'd be happy to answer them. Um, I can put you in touch with him. Um, if you have any super detailed lithium questions, I won't be able to answer them, <laughs> um, but I'll try my best today. Um, so what I thought I'd do is I'd, I'd just take you through our, our latest lithium market view. Um, I'll touch on a couple of the things that we've just had in the panel, a great discussion that we've just had over the last hour. Um, and any of you have any questions on, on what I present and, and across the battery metals, I'd be happy to help. Um, interesting comments from Joel on, on kind of demand forecast and, and what we're expecting in the future. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in the presentation. Um, so just as an introduction to Benchmark Mineral Intelligence, if, if you're not aware, um, we're, we're a leading provider of, of market intelligence and um, consulting services to the lithium ion battery sector. Um, we're, we're very focused on, on that sector entirely, um, the EV, EV penetration, energy transition. So you can see the, the spectrum of products that we have um, at Benchmark. So starting at the top, we're, we're principally a price reporting agency. Um, so we've got a large number of of um, price assessments that we do on a weekly, monthly basis. Um, I, I won't go through all of them, but you can see there, and, th and that list is constantly growing. And we're starting to look now more into the, the mid and downstream and about how we, how we do price assessments for, for anodes and cathodes, um, and potentially even recycling products such as black mass in future. Um, in, the, in the middle, we've got a spectrum of services across our forecasting consultancy and, and ESG teams. Um, forecasting is, is kind of traditional market analysis um, reports um, for the next 20 years um, across all of the major battery metals markets. Um, more recently, we've started introducing uh, ESG and life cycle assessment reports as well um, that, it, that are specific to individual markets. Um, we've already got one for lithium. The, the nickel and cobalt work is coming out very shortly, um, and I'll touch a little bit about that in my cobalt presentation tomorrow. Um, I'm actually from the consultancy business, so we do individual client work um, with, with some of the investors that are here today, um, looking at big problems in, in the sector and, and how we kind of shape the sector and the supply chains going forwards. Um, and then finally, we, we've got a we've very, very strong news and, and events business. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we were in Perth for, for one of the um, Gigafactory events. Um, and we've got Benchmark Week coming up in, in November. So if, if you've got if you've got any interest in any of those things, please come and grab me at lunch or, or today or tomorrow. So I'll, I'll jump straight into it. Um, this, is our, this is our latest um, lithium market balance. Um, there's, there's a lot on this slide, so let's start on the left. Um, we've, we've got a, a variety of, of outlooks. Um, and, and as Joel mentioned, it, it's important to to think about some kind of the upside and downside risks here, but you can see that the, the picture is pretty similar in, in all eventualities. Um, so in the short term, we're, we're certainly seeing the deficit persisting for lithium. Um, we've obviously got very strong prices at the moment. They've been strong for much of this year um, and we expect that to continue, potentially even raise higher. Um, we, we don't realistically see the market reaching any kind of sustainable level of balance until the mid 2020s that's in our base case um but you can see obviously in an in an upside ev scenario um that that goes to the point where we're we're not seeing any kind of balancing in in the mid to long term um so there there would in that scenario there would be a even greater need for investment um where that comes from and where that ends up um, is obviously the big question. So just a comparison of our of our EV forecasting in the base case, uh, we've got penetration of 21% in 2025 um, versus 36%, sorry, versus 24% in the upside. So you can see that only a 3% change in EV penetration in 2025 makes that much difference to the balance 
it, it's pretty sensitive. Um, in 2030, it's 36% in the base case versus 43 in the in the upside scenario. On on the right hand side, obviously we we it's it's similar way of showing the same thing, but. In the kind of the oranges, you've got the operating supply at the bottom, and then in the blue shades, you've got all of the kind of the spectrum of pro projects that we're monitoring, um, and and that's using our ranking system of, of the likelihood of those projects. The lighter blue colors are obviously less likely, and and will come out further in the outlook. Um, but again, you can see from the from the mid to late twenty twenties is when demand really starts to accelerate. We, we've obviously got very strong demand growth already, um, but until EVs start to become a major major part of the of vehicle sales um that's really when um demand will start to pick up um and i think it's worth noting on the bottom right so that kind of yellowy orange color is the secondary supply um, and we touched on it in the previous panel you can see in the kind of the 10 to 20 year view that starts to become a ver fairly significant chunk of the potential supply outlook um, and that is obviously uncertain and and it's really more dependent on on the economics of the nickel and cobalt recycling than it is for lithium as we all know there's there's complications with lithium um recycling from a technical perspective but also an economic perspective so so if you were to reduce that share then then the kind of the potential requirement for investment in the sector is, is massive so so how do we kind of quantify that this is kind of a bit of a, a, a thought for exercise um so if you if you wanted to bridge the 2030 supply gap, so comparing current supply to what we'll need in 2030, um, it would cost you about 42 billion dollars, and that's that's the equivalent of what it cost to buy Twitter, but it's significantly less than than what some of the the streaming services spend on original content, 50 billion, and significantly less also than than what some of those OEMs spend in one year on on R and D. So, so as we've as we've just heard, the OEMs have got plenty of money, um, but it, it's how they use it and how they kind of get up the learning curve and start to understand some of these markets. And that's of course where where companies such as Benchmark come in to support support that learning process and support the development of these sectors. And and it's worth noting that, that forty two billion that's kind of assuming a fairly similar supply split to where we're, where we're seeing now. So still fairly China dominated, which is obviously cheaper supply refining from Australian spodumene primarily. If we if we go to a scenario where we need more, a greater share of North American and European content, which I'll come to later on, that's obviously going to increase. So it seems fairly unlikely that 42 billion will be here in, in 10 years time or five years time, but it could, that number could be even higher. And of course, lithium supply is, is very geopolitical um as it is across across the battery metals really um we're not expecting a a refining bottleneck um we, our view is that really the the investment and the development needs to come in the upstream um in the mining um and that's that relies on countries such as australia um chile the emergent emerging players in argentina and other parts of the world um but as i mentioned if we do want to see further development and kind of less of a requirement on on Chinese supply, then we're going to need even greater levels of investment in in North America and Europe. And th this is quite small, but it, I think it's it should kind of represent across the metals that we cover, not just lithium. Um, so this is the market share of the kind of the major stages of the supply chain. The red bars you can see are. Uh, of the China share and as you go further downstream it becomes more and more China dominant so you can see the cathode and anode stages we're talking 80 to 90 percent in China in lithium battery production it's about 80 percent and of course the the EV sales still kind of half the market in China um, it does vary market on market but in general um, we're still very leveraged on on China and and we talked about the IRA policy in the previous panel. Um, there's also talk of potentially similar policy being developed in Europe. And that kind of localization, regionalization strategy will mean that there needs to be further investment in North America and Europe so that we have 
mid and downstream capacity closer to the end users, so closer to the EV sales in, in those major markets. And, and that obviously becomes with, comes with a lot of challenge. Um, but if, if, those, if those policies such as the IRA are going to be followed through on, then that, that needs to happen. And of course, we, we can't forget ESG. Um, as I mentioned, we, we are developing ESG services across the metals that we cover at Benchmark. Um, this is an example of, of some of the content that you can get from, from our Lithium report. So we're, we, were one of the, we were the first provider to introduce a tiered system for the Lithium um, supply chain. Um, so what we do is we rank all of the, all of the Lithium players um, globally. Um, against a variety of ESG metrics. And that enables us to kind of think about what the, what the potential for some of these suppliers are. Um, so recently SQM have, have decided to invest in, in Chinese refining capacity, which um, from an ESG angle may not be very, very positive from a transparency and, and sourcing perspective, but given that SQM are kind of in our, our benchmark approved tier, that that may be a positive step for the, for the sector as a whole. And we may start to see improvement more generally um, in, in China and in lithium refining and um, ESG kind of reporting as a whole. Because at the moment, we're only around a third of, of those refiners in China produce ESG reporting. Uh, and then that needs to change um, to improve the traceability across the supply chain. So I touched earlier on about how we, how we our, our view is that there won't be a a refining bottleneck it's really in the upstream and, and we kind of refer to this as the raw material disconnect um, we need a, a significant amount of investment in the upstream to enable the transition to happen as everyone's expecting for those ev penetration rates to be achieved but you can see at the bottom left that that's the longest step in the chain we all know how long it takes from boots on the ground exploration through to actually producing a product that you can sell to the market. The, the subsequent s steps are quicker. Um, you obviously don't need to refine, you don't need to find a resource, you just need to develop, you just need to process it and develop it. Um, so that's really the, the issue for the sector at the moment is that we, we need raw materials, um, but it's, there is gonna be a lag in the system. Um, and, and that's why we're not seeing the, the lithium market balancing until until at least the mid 2020s, if not later, if there's any delay in any of the expected projects. And and we touched on it. Well, I thought um, Adam's analogy about the smile economy was a nice one, and we've kind of touched on it here about you you may call the margin at the top and the bottom of the supply chain, and the, and the the middle gets stuck. Um, and I guess just a just a question to really wrap up on is is how will that change in the future? Um, will the OEMs need to start sharing a bit of margin um, to ensure that this transition continues um, in, in the way that we're all hoping for? And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Harry. Um, uh, that, that was really good. I guess. The big question is, what does it all mean for price? Um, compared to, you know, obviously price has gone from, spot domain price has gone from $400 a tonne to 5,000. What that's saying is demand is strong and supply is constrained. Yeah. What's your view on, uh, on price? Yeah, so as I said, we're, we're not seeing any kind of major change in the market balance over the next few years. Um, and that will mean that prices will will remain elevated at least the levels we're seeing now. Um, we're not seeing any reason for prices to adjust down as, as we've heard from some of the major banks recently. Um, yeah, we're not, we're not seeing any reason for that to adjust downwards. Um, unlike other markets that we touched on in the last session, nickel, cobalt, they've obviously had some downward pressure from macro conditions and some kind of specifics for, for cobalt, which I'll touch on tomorrow. But, um, Lithium's kind of bucked that trend. Um, and, and as you mentioned about the BMX auctions, that I think that's really a good kind of indication of the demand in the market. Every time they do one of those auctions, it just keeps going higher and 
people keep saying it's going to drop and it's not dropping. Um, so that's that's a that's a good kind of bellwether of of where the industry's at. Um, but as as our market balance showed, there's no reason f or from a kind of a purely economic market analysis perspective that prices will significantly adjust down. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Harry. Uh, are you able to explain what actually happens in recycling of these batteries to uh, get the components? I'm not an expert, and I, I, I might pass over to Adam to, to explain the details, but I, I think for, from my understanding, the, the logistics and the um, dismantling of the batteries is actually probably one of the most complex steps. Um, once you get beyond that, you kind of get into the hydro and pyrometallurgy and the, the pros and cons of that. But the the physical logistics of getting the phone battery that's in your pocket and that we've all got in our pockets or eventually our car batteries to a central point and then safely dismantling them and pulling out all the individual components because they're ultimately they're very hazardous materials. That's very difficult in, its, in itself. And... Australia is obviously fairly remote, but there's there's way more remote parts of the world that is going to become really difficult in 20, 30, 40, 50 years time when you've got an EV in some far flung pace that you need to re recover that material. And you may be forced by policy to recover that material as well. And do you know the breakdown between EV batteries that would be recycled compared to um, other domestic things, whether it's household tool plus plus phones, et cetera? It's, it's obviously a, a huge unknown and we're not gonna see a big wave of recycled material probably until the early 2030s. Um, if you look at the kind of the ramp up in EV penetration, it was about 8% last year, um, but it's only really started to kick off in the last couple of years. So if, you, if you're looking at a 10 or 15 year life for those, for those EVs, and that's even before reuse and, and second life, if, you, if you're assuming they go straight to recycling, that we're not going to see a big amount of EV material until the early 2030s. So the, the the recyclers at the moment are primarily using phones, laptops, your, your, your drill that you've got at home, that kind of material, but it's obviously fairly small volumes. Um, but it's enabling them to test their systems. Um, so I'd say for the next, at least the next five years, if not longer, most of it's going to be consumable, consumer electronics and, and small other electronic items. Thank you very much.